Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday of NIA Connect. I'm Cheryl Durst. I'm the Executive Vice President and CEO of IIDA, the International Interior Design Association. And I'm so very honored to have you join me today for a conversation with two phenomenal women that I so admire. We are going to be talking about art, culture, and design, and the experience of all of those. Um, I think I've got one housekeeping slide um, for those of you who are um, wanting and getting CEU credits, continuing education credits for this to receive credit. You must attend the entire webinar and your credits will be reported within seven business days if you registered with a member number. If you didn't register, please contact CEU at IIDA.org with your IIDA or IDCEC numbers. And thank you for that. And now let's get started with this important conversation. Joining me uh, today are Madeline Grinstein, who is the Pritzker Director of the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago, and renowned Chicago-based artist and architect, Amanda Williams. And when we thought about this program many weeks ago, the world is not what it is now. Um, these two pandemics that we're dealing with, this COVID-19 pandemic and this pandemic of racism, and we've got obviously the racial unrest following the death of George Floyd, our lives have so fundamentally been changed. The way we work, the way we relate to one another, the way we spend time with our loved ones, everything has been changed. Um, but how has it changed the ways that we think about now and in the future, how we will experience art and design. Art is so critical in spurring conversations on justice and equity, and artists play such an important role in our society and an important role in the narrative around our response to a global crisis. We know that now more than ever, society turns to a visual culture in an effort to translate the challenges we're facing into visions of a better tomorrow. And I wanna jump right into this conversation with Amanda and Madeline, who have known each other, um, uh, who are longtime collaborators. And we're going to take this conversation through, through the lens of access. It's such an important word right now, and such a relevant word right now. And Madeline, let me start with you as a, as a museum director, and given the general tone and tenor of our times, what does a term like access mean to both museums and artists, and particularly a place as vital to the city of Chicago as the Museum of Contemporary Art? Thanks, Cheryl. And first of all, thank you for the invitation, Cheryl Durst and IIDA. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. And I also want to acknowledge not only the fantastic Amanda Williams and all the incredible contributions that she's made to our culture through her work and her person, but I also want to acknowledge Cheryl in her capacity as a trustee of the Museum of Contemporary Art and in her capacity as a great philanthropist and teacher and mentor. So thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. So access, right. It, uh, that word itself, I think, uh, has changed a lot for us all just in the last two weeks. Um, the term, when, when you asked me what uh, access means, um, you talked about um, you know, having access, the museum being accessible to multiple audiences. And that is, of course, um, I think a, a given that access uh, to museums, uh, museums need to commit themselves to being accessible uh, to as many people as possible by providing as many stories as possible and particularly stories that haven't um, been um, highlighted uh, as they should have been in, in the last years. Um, that, so um, that engaging museums that way is, is um, rather 
operating around access that way is a given. Mm -hmm. um, now, since mid-March, uh, when most museums closed uh, because of COVID, access um, became uh, very different. Um, there has been a kind of a hot lens on digital access for museums. And that in and of itself uh, is creating some very, very um, beneficial and interesting work around um, access. Uh, because you can reach that many more people if you lift the hurdles of what is called threshold fear. The mobility issues that you have arriving at the physical campus or the economic issues that you have to clear to arrive at a physical campus are mitigated if you offer a, an even warmer welcome on behalf of the museum in the digital sphere. So that's something that I think is very, very important for museums to consider going forward. Um, and access, of course, uh, means community, and, uh, and uh, community means not only access, but IDEA, inclusion, diversity, access, equity, and now, within the last, it's since the last two weeks, but always, and now also justice. So we not only need to think about access, but we need to think about access, equity, and justice, as well as diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. not only across our galleries, and Cheryl very nicely put up two images of our incredible exhibition that closed a mere eight days after we opened it, of Duro Olowu, our British, the British Nigerian fashion designer, I'm wearing his jacket, um, of his curated exhibition of works from public and private collections drawn from all over Chicago. Um, so we're not just talking about access to galleries, we need to actually cut through and think about access, equity, and justice, not only through the galleries, but through our programming, through our operations, through our workplace, through our board membership, and through our staff membership. Um, it is, it is um, the long and the short of it is this, Co COVID, and access and equity and racial injustice are, are the same problem. Mm. They're all imbricated in one another. Mm. And museums would be, uh, and it is now upon museums to address all of them, all of those issues that's, with equal measure. Yeah, that's perfect. Amanda, you've been such a staunch and vocal advocate on behalf of artists during, during COVID. And you have this amazing established history and body of work that kind of straddles art and architecture um, as, your, as kind of your media to highlight. How is this moment that we're living in right this second, it feels like literally, how is this moment impacting the work that you're doing? Um, I, I think that's happening on kind of twofold. I think these, these images evidence that the work has been long and that I've seen uh, museums and cultural institutions as partners in kind of complicating um, what these relationships can be. Most of the work I've made has been for an audience of people that look like me and have lived or do live in places um, that I have lived in or have grown up in. And so for the MCA in particular, for this exhibition um, that I had a few years ago, the question was how do I bring those kinds of concerns to a clearly different in a clearly different kind of institutional space that wasn't necessarily um, historically interested in that. And so what does it mean when all of a sudden people that didn't seem to pay any attention to you pay attention to you? And so that's exactly what's happening in this moment for a lot of artists, a lot of black people in particular, who have been doing this work, whether that's art or community organizing or law and justice, and find themselves now with a global set of supposed allies. <laughs> so yeah. it's a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, it makes the actual work hard to do. I told somebody a few weeks ago on a panel that I was on um, for my high school kind of alumni conversation, you know, when you're doing this work all the time, it's tiring. And so then to be expected to um, articulate how the work might change or what work needs to be done, there's always this sort of double-edged sword that you know, artists are going to be ultra productive or they're going to respond to the moment instantly or they're going to provide the visuals that help everybody. 
And a number of artists have done that, especially artists that are publicly engaged or muralists or public artists. Um, that's kind of their calling all the time, the immediacy and the urgency. And I've seen a range of ways that artists have in general responded. I gave myself um, space to not do anything because I'm doing this all the time. And so there, this really was a moment to kind of marinate on the work because of the pace of which my work had been operating. Um, and to actually also remember that a lot of the work that we do as cultural producers, as bellwethers of the time, requires that we be in the world. So a lot of the specific quote unquote work I've done, you know, whether it's, you know, helping announce the governor and the mayor's fund that is going to be immediate financial relief, whether it's speaking to the fact that artists are actually small business owners and we're not charitable cases, um, talking about the, ne the necessity for self care, you know, so all those things fold back into it and really find a way to help nurture, um, you know, future work. So there's not always this kind of pressure to produce in the immediate and articulate what that is. Yeah. Um, of late, I was really just being silly, but I, on Instagram one night, I was really uncomfortable with the black squares for Blackout Tuesday um, a few mm -hmm. Tuesdays ago. And so I just started offering which black? There are a hundred million, you know, like black people are not monolithic. Blackness is not monolithic. We have yet to really talk about intersectionality of trans uh, trans bodies and uh, immigrants and all these things that people are doing the work all the time think about but the general public that is now engaged with issues of justice and unrest don't necessarily you know they're not threading those needles yet and it's and, and we're here to support that but that work has to come and so for me it was really a kind of tongue-in-cheek question of which which black are you talking which black lives are you talking about and so I've started this Instagram um, kind of post every day that's really caught fire so I think that's also an example of when you don't premeditate or you don't put pressure to, to respond in the time, really beautiful things come of that. Color theory was very much as well. But there's a pressure when you're talking about um, being, the moment, being the thing that marks the time, being the people that produce the objects that mark the time. It sometimes feels overwhelming to, um, to not be doing something because it seems like you're missing a moment. So yeah. for me, that's kind of the full spectrum of what's been happening in terms of um, how I've responded. A lot of talking and kind of articulating both frustrations and pathways forward. Um, that's such a that's such a brilliant point, Amanda. And that fact that you do need to take that that moment to um, express who we are um, as society and culture. I think back in the day, people thought about art and artists as being very self-referential, um, that it was about the self, but you are reflecting the culture, the collective. And art reminds us not only of who we are, but who we can be. And you know, I think that message is so important right now. Um, Madeline, why are artists like Amanda so important to the mission of museums like the MCA? Um, what does her work tell us about our city and about the museum? Well, Amanda's work uh, and the work of great artists like her um, are flashlights. They point us towards the future and the society that we want to be. So they are our near future script. And uh, it's incumbent upon us to uh, elevate their, um, their work and, and their voices without at the same time, and here's the walk that we're walking since the last two weeks, without at the same time asking for them to take on the burden of explaining entirely and only the, for them to explain exclusively and only the issues of racial justice that have been in place and the structural racism that has been in place for centuries. Um, it's, it's a mistake uh, to ask them to continue to solely bear the burden of that explanation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great point. Let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into um, kind of our touchstone word, access. And so, throughout COVID, throughout the COVID pandemic, while we've been isolated, more people worldwide than ever before have virtually visited museums and 
cultural institutions and attended events like the ballet or the opera. Many folks have never physically done that before, prior to COVID. Yet after a virtual visit, statistics are showing us that people are 30% more likely to return to a cultural institution in real life once we can do that again. Um, what does this mean for museums? What does this mean for artists? What does this mean for people who are seeing your work for the first time? And do institutions like museums have additional responsibilities for these new audiences? And so I think a little bit, let's talk about access for people who don't actually have access. And what does that mean? Like that, you know, again, in all the things that have changed in our world, what we have access to has changed as well. But I know, Amanda, you make some good points that digital access isn't even accessible for everyone. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, in the same ways that uh, the COVID pandemic was able to highlight or unexpectedly highlighted these disparities that we saw most, most prevalently, obviously, with health and pre-existing conditions among the African-American community here in Chicago. I think it just opened this lens to just how far um, the schism is becoming between the haves and the have-nots. So you all sort of know it um, intuitively if you're moving through the city at any given point, but to really see it kind of drill down. Um, and so for me, it's been really trying to think about other ways um, other ways to get the message out, but I'm also intrigued with this idea of how many people have reached out as a result of exactly what you said. So I was trying to pull the name up and can't, I'll hopefully get it before the end of the panel, but there's a fourth grade teacher in Quincy, Illinois, and he reached out and he said, as a result of the schools being closed, he went online and looked all these things up. And so whether the students were able to log in or whether he's able to provide sort of makeshift packages, he could use the work that I'm doing around Shirley Chisholm and then also the color theory work to get the kids to think about their environments because they're at home now so they can move through, right? So it's really beautiful to realize that the connectivity that's always there, but I'm often overwhelmed with social media and, and kind of the internet in general, to realize how many people were then able to pause and as you said, log into something or travel to Versailles and to really feel access, even if it wasn't gonna be true, so I'm excited to see in this moment, now that the, the kind of institutions writ large from education to museums to government, the, the call, the mandate is there. The, the genie's out of the bottle, it's not going back. So with this overabundance of energy towards making things clear, making them plain, making them just and accessible, that statistic now of people wanting to visit, I'm really intrigued to see how much that happens. I'm, I'm thinking even to the Black Lives Matter on the ground that the mayor, uh, I'm gonna say commissioned in Washington, DC. You know, that's public art. That's public you know, art. So that's it's just a great kind of moment, even with people that don't necessarily have access to the digital, everybody in the satellites are beaming it, right? Like this, this is a beautiful way to kind of understand what expression means. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very intrigued to see what that means. And then obviously for communities that do have access, uh, much of this audience that are designed or, or visual cultural folks, you know, it's really, it is really great. It's wonderful because you had to pause. And at some point there were too many, there were too many Zooms to watch. You know, it's like, I wanna see Amy Silman and I'm gonna see Tokasi Dyson and I'm gonna watch a video on, you know, Robert Ryan and I'm gonna, you know, like this was my chance to catch up also on all these things that you never get to do. Um, so I'm intrigued. I feel like we need time for it to marinate, but it'll be interesting to see across the spectrum, what does it mean to now have been given carte blanche to everywhere almost? Right, right. The, those barriers, the some of the traditional barriers are removed. One very simple um, fact that I read, more parents, while they were um, teaching at home, more parents took field trips virtually to museums with their kids. We're all accustomed to seeing the lineup of the school buses in front of museums and every, you know, you get a few chaperone parents, but this fact that kids and parents together were able to enjoy a museum experience, that's gotta add up to something. 
Madeline, as a museum director, what do you think that this, um, you know, this, this idea of access that more people than ever before have accessed the museum virtually and then will be coming to you in real life? Yeah, no, I'm super excited by what you say, Cheryl and, and Amanda. And in fact, just to add just one more data point, Cheryl, since you said, you know, 30% are now more likely to come. Um, Pre-COVID, the museum sector was welcoming 850 million visitors a year. That's, that's two and a half times the population of the United States. So, you know, that's pretty remarkable. So imagine that plus 30%. So let's go, you know, let's, yeah. let's get, this is great. Let's take advantage of this. Uh, and, uh, you know, Amanda's absolutely right. The online museum is, is here to stay. Um, now, pre-COVID, you know, we already had a lot of us already had a kind of very fulsome virtual platform, uh, you know, but now they're going to be standalone offerings. They're going to really, they're really, they're going to, they're going to be digitally specific standalone offerings. And those digital gains will be, you know, full partners and permanent partners in expanding access. Now, again, you know, as, as Amanda rightly points out, not everybody has access to, to technology. Um, so, um, for those who do then, for museums, to repeat myself, um, it becomes incumbent upon the digital, the digital museum to become intentionally welcoming uh, and, and to become intentionally inclusive in terms of how you literally click into it and in terms of content. So that is absolutely paramount to building this incredible new com community opportunity. Uh, and again, as we mentioned, digital space breaks down distance and mobility. So combine that with the fact that you don't have these normal threshold fear uh, components like the guard at the door mm -hmm. or not having money to, uh, for the admissions desk or not quite understanding the code. If you lift all of that, you can bring in a whole swath of amazing people. If you get, if you get that spatial design, to speak yeah. in your industry terms, out of the way, yeah. um, you can bring in a whole swath of great people who otherwise uh, have, a, have, a, have psychological barriers, not just mm -hmm. physical barriers. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. And as to programming, here's the thing that I learned. Um, uh, we had a program um, with uh, Jean Kirby Raymond, um, a Zoom, uh, because we, had a, we have a series called The Dialogue. Um, and he was supposed to be in our theater, which is 300 seats. So we put it on Zoom and we had 400, 500 people more than we would have ever accommodated in the theater, which you and Amanda know that theater well. Um, so why not? Why not migrate our marquee lectures and large gatherings as a permanent fixture to our digital museum and focus on more intimate offerings uh, and, and private contemplation at the physical museum? Because by the way, that's also probably better in, in COVID, post-COVID land. And then finally, um, you know, not only are um, young people incredibly, incredibly uh, engaged in the in the digital sphere and so it's a great way to talk to them but really intelligent let's say older populations who are also vulnerable to COVID will be self-isolating in waves going forward mm -hmm. if we're listening to CDC and, and the, the rhythm of the virus mm -hmm. so we really need to be accountable to those culturally inclined really intelligent and caring people as well and there could be opportunities where we bring these sort of different generations together on the web that could be very exciting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with that idea of access, the ability that it's not just art on the floor and art on the walls, or you have the ability to interact with the artist. And so from a museum programming standpoint, that ability to have a conversation with an artist and as opposed to trying to figure out their process or interpret it for yourself, again, that access that we have now digitally allows the, those really rich conversations with artists and it just becomes more real. And I think, Madeline, you were talking about kind of the psychological effects, the psychological barriers and the spatial barriers. Some people have just been in the past intimidated by museums or even intimidated by artists. But if you've had a conversation with an artist via Zoom, um, that's just going to change your, your opinion around your access and your ability to, to touch those folks. 
Madeline, let me ask you, tied to access is that important word equity. And it's critical to the museum, um, to the MCA in particular, and to so many museums across the country. Equity is not easy work, right? It's sticky and it's messy. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it means to, to do that work in the context of a museum? It is really critical and incredibly hard. And there is the, the path is is we're 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 building the bicycle as we're riding it, and many of us are ahead of it, and many of us are behind, and we need to uh, give each other a lot of um, mutual empathy as we move forward, but also hold ourselves accountable. Yeah. Um, museums have a unique and critical role to play in helping build a society that is that has an increased sense of social responsibility that is equitable, that is inclusive, and that is just. And that um, is going to look very different from um, the project of the museum a year ago, five years ago, and 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. we have to really, really listen and pay attention and act on um, the situation uh, that, the situations that we're facing and, and uh, the voices that, that we are hearing. Uh, and work together to foster greater equity, accessibility, inclusion. Again, not only in our galleries, but in our programming, in our operations, in our workplace, with our vendors, with our trustees, with our artists, and so on. Um, so, um, <clears throat> equity. Um, as I said, um, we are going, we are now, let us, let us say this out loud, that uh, museums are now um, post-COVID equity and justice organizations, right? They have, to, they have to look at themselves through those lenses. Um, up until two weeks ago, museums were dealing with the emergency of COVID. Uh, and, the, uh, and the issues of structural racism uh, in museums were generally being acknowledged and acted upon as part of their good work uh, in a variety of ways from next to nothing to truly material changes. I'm talking about the museums at large. Yep. The last two weeks have shifted that prioritization and aligned that, those priorities so that the last two weeks demand that museums accelerate their work in the area of equity and justice and it will be an I will say to you now, um, it will be an excruciating challenge for museums to become both post-COVID and dismantle structural racism at the same time. There's no choice, but it is going to hurt. It is going to hurt personally, professionally, institutionally. It's going to be excruciating and it's necessary. So here's the thing. We know this. What will really drive everybody crazy is the speed at which we'll be able to accomplish it. <laughs> it's already too slow. And for many, it will not be fast enough, even when we put this hot lens on it. Yeah. My staff is rightfully demanding concrete actions that the MCA should take in support of equity and justice. I'm demanding that of the museum. And we're working as quickly as we can and as smartly as we can. And it's never, it's never soon enough. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because I think we're in this moment now. We, I feel like last week we had all the words, right? We had all of the posts with all of the words and all of the narratives. And now it needs to be about, so what are we going to do? Um, what are we going to do collectively? What am, I'm going, what am I going to do? What are you going to do as individuals? We have to move into action mode. And that's gonna be so critical for museums and museum directors and, and artists too, Amanda. Um, you know, dealing with the action. Um, you know, art is an activist expression as well. <clears throat> and, your work has always been important. I feel like it's going to become even more important that people will be able to 
understand and attach to your activism as it becomes their activism? Yeah, I think definitely. So I think, um, you know, I think two things. I think that in terms of what Madeline is saying, I think that it, it can't happen fast enough, but it also can't, um, it can't ignore all of the small gains that have been happening at a pace that was rightfully described as too slow. Um, but I've said this before in other forums, um, you know, the, I've had extended engagement with the MCA, with MoMA, with the Pulitzer Arts Foundation. You know, so these are all obviously places that, you know, were esteemed and kind of, you know, held in high regard for me. But I was really interested in the challenges that each one um, is experiencing and, and presented to me with this interest in engaging in the kind of work that I do. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're on three year cycles for museums or, you know, eight months out for press releases or images or the kind of nuts and bolts. And so it's great to have that larger idea. But what happens when, you know, mid project, you know, Andres Hernandez and I, who are collaborators in St. Louis, we changed the whole timeline of the exhibition. There was no opening date. We wanted the whole thing to open over eight months. Sounds great. How do you engage a public for that long? How do you sustain attention? How do you deal with world issues that come up that disrupt whatever was going on? How does the comms department, you know, message around it? So there's all these kinds of nuts and bolts that in an effort to say we are committed to helping artists express themselves and explore in real time, what does that really look like? You know, what does that mean to bring Inglewood to the MCA? And then to find out that maybe Inglewood doesn't want to be at the MCA. So what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? <laughs> What does that mean when the when the the security staff or I'm thinking of the, the team at, at the loading dock, you know, is more engaged with me than the curatorial staff? They both were great, right? But I, that was unexpected. So there are all these kinds of moments that I think we still also have to build upon, and then look at broader organizing histories. I'm part of an amazing cohort of classmates from Cornell, and we've been in touch daily almost with the with the current new dean. She's got to deal with this right now. So there's no time for thinking about and convening conversations and let's have a think tank. Nope. And we're already your answer and we're not going to do your work for you. So now what does it mean to have a partner, but not hold hands in that way, right? What does it mean to kind of have to catch up to 400 years of history you didn't have to know, sink it in, and now translate it to very logistical things like budgets and line, you know, tenure lines and across departments and a board of trustees who maybe isn't all on board and you know so the that long sticky work has been done it's been successful in other places or other times in history and so that's when I, I really feel like we all have to be students of history in those moments to really think about how do we bring our, our current experiences and the young voices who are not relenting and they're out there and they're telling us about ourselves and bringing it in but also pulling in we've been here before we know what this looks like. Yeah. We know that the attention span is about this. We know that people are gonna get tired after this much. Mm -hmm. We know that after marching, this should come. So how do we pull all of that in to probably what's been the most significant topic to be avoided that's now open? So how do we, and the, the what, what, you know, black, what black is this you say? And that people are disparate. You know, there's somebody that doesn't agree with what I'm saying, but also really believes in equity and justice. How do, we, how do we engage each other in those dialogues? So I'm hopeful that we'd reach this tension of not communicating and being at each other's throats because of the current political climate. That can't continue if the folks that are on the same part of the spectrum, but differing in how to get there, wanna do this work. Everybody's gotta take a deep breath and know that we're gonna make mistakes and keep it moving. We do that already, right? So it's like, right. I think we have these smaller lessons that maybe seem like failures at an institutional level or at some board or some metric that should have been met that need to be revisited and really considered as potential successes that just need to be tried again or tried when everybody's ears are open now. Or, right. you know, there's, right. this is the moment for that, but I think we can't be afraid of the failure and we can't be afraid to interrogate what we've done in the past that might work now that didn't seem to work before and a lot yeah. of my work is iterative as a designer anyway but i think mm -hmm. you're going to start seeing that across across spectrums not just artists yeah um let's uh, so the 600 or so folks that are with us on uh as part of this conversation a vast percentage of them are designers and architects and involved in the design industry as product manufacturers and so 
this, our audience knows, as you two know, that place matters, right? Place absolutely matters to us as human beings. We, we crave and demand a sense of place. Amanda, your work speaks so specifically about place. And then Madeline, we know that a sense of place is very critical for museums. Let's for a minute talk about how in a, in a post-pandemic world, what place is going to mean to artists and designers and then to museums. Amanda, can you, can you jump in on sense yeah, I'm of gonna, place? I'm going to start with a little, it's not quite an anecdote, but I have two young daughters. And of course, you know, all of a sudden, my husband and I were homeschoolers. And so we thought we knew our, our girls. We spent a lot of time with them. Madeline knows them well. They come and interrogate her and tell her what to do with the museum. But they very quickly carved out different types of places in the house that were where they needed to work. And so we've already fostered a sense of independence and in that they have ownership of things. So they, they own the house, they own their environment, right? They walk confidently, but it was so fascinating to watch them set up how each of them needed their environment for learning. And that would have never happened. We've never known that had it not been for COVID, right? And so I sympathize with people that are multi-generational in the house that's two rooms and there's eight people or there's, because that, that physical and then connection to that mental space to be able to say, nobody's gonna come here and touch my pencils or I like to face the light or mm. I'm happy. You know what, I wanna, I wanna look at this image on the wall all day. Like the, the privilege of that is so amazing to be able to, you know, to do that and that they just sort of naturally, now obviously their mother's an architect, but that they sort of naturally just made it happen. And it just drove home for me that I'm always talking about place and sense of place and connection to identity, but you can lose sight even when you're entrenched in that work of how important it is for every human being to just have a space to call their own. To call their and, own. Yeah. Right? And so we're in this moment where, especially with Black people historically, because of the way the United States has been structured, if you weren't even a human to begin with, and then you're emancipated, but every single piece of land has been carved out and owned by someone else, how, how can you function? You know, so the, the conceptual looking for the 40 acres and, and this mule that's gonna help you move through it, that's very real in a, in a moment where people are not only trying to find their social place, all of a sudden everybody thinks their lives matter, but how do they use that to leverage and navigate like, carving out space for themselves that's really and then we as designers and you know so it's not just reimagining six feet apart or reimagining ada or or you know zoning rules or these kind those are all necessities but really what does it mean to design to make sure that even if it's for 30 seconds or a minute if you're at a bus stop or if you're in an elevator now or mm -hmm. like how are we going to design these kinds of spaces that are supposed to be public and civic but really aren't because you know, when kids couldn't be in a house eight or 12 to a sibling and cousin, the parks got closed. I totally understand how the mayor had to operate and operationalize the city, but when all public space certain, all of a sudden becomes surveilled and policed, and that's the only place you have, gotta sit out on the porch because it's 90 degrees, like what are we really gonna do as designers to think about giving those moments of equity, giving, working for the long term, but even in these short term, in these little moments, I have no idea what the answer is. It sounds like a really hard problem, but I'm really gonna start to think about that in addition to just calling attention to the history of redlining. Yes, it's important. The reason why there are no grocery stores here or that the bridges going up created this kind of schism of haves and have nots again, right? That the city is primed for this kind of reaction because it's been designed in such a segregated, gridded, limited way. But why, how are we as designers going to think on that smaller level of giving place to people in that way, giving ownership of like forming their own place? I think it's really powerful, especially as Madeline said, we're going to be in probably in waves isolated and not isolated. How do we think about it? And, and is there an empathy for people who the, the incarcerated population, um, our elders who are, uh, you know, in convalescence, like, what does it mean to design for that? It's not just anymore, you know, the pattern of the wallpaper versus the floor or, you know, my, my ideals about color and, and implications of space. Like, what does it really mean to give in one room for people their place? It's their really place. a powerful question. Yeah, and, and place is so personal and, and having agency over your place, it matters to, to all of us. 
And this, this notion you hear people, I, I was so glad you brought up the example of parks. Parks are so important to uh, the city of Chicago and there is a true connection. You hear people talking about going to my park as opposed to the park. And, you know, because it's, they own that place. It's, it is private yet it's public. And that sense of ownership over place is so incredible. It's empowering and we require it. Um, Madeline, I, the same thing happens in the museum. People have spaces with galleries within the museum that they're particularly attached to. Um, a sense of place in a museum is critical. How, how is the museum addressing place in a, in a post-COVID world? Yeah, that, that is a really, really interesting question. And where, where that question makes me go is that is to one of our core values, which is that we're deeply, deeply committed, particularly at this moment in time, to building social fabric through dialogue uh, and uh, engagement. So the MCA, um, at the MCA, we believe so deeply in the spatial dimension to create that social belonging that we actually did a renovation and an entire internal renovation of 12,000 square feet where we put into the physical and therefore philosophical institutional heart of the building a space called the commons whose primary function is to create platforms and opportunities for discourse and dialogue because Discourse is the way to uh, mutual values in community. So that's how much we believe in the spatial dimension uh, that, that assists in the building of social belonging, which is what we need now in these very divisive times. Um, so that, uh, you know, how does that, how do, how do we do that now in COVID, right? Uh, how do we gather people together to experience art and experience each other's perspectives. So um, until our confidence in public gathering is restored, we absolutely have to think about how to gather differently. Right. Mm -hmm. So safe physical participation, we know this. We know that it, it, we, we are seeing it. Online convenings, carefully monitored small museum sited programs. I think that we need to think about ways to go even beyond that. As long as our buildings and our locations, our liabilities, COVID and justice can productively help us think about how to invert our focus from our museums and find other visible, credible, and relevant ways to appear in our community at large, to mm -hmm. appear outside of our walls. We have to be leaders in art and civic life. That's, that's how it happens. So we are going to, you know, we are going to create, of course, uh, opportunities to engage in, in safe and in, in engaging discourse. But I think we need to think about um, a different balance of what happens inside and outside of the museum so that we really develop a wider outreach that builds on shared values and community through the lens of art and culture. And, and in gathering, uh, you know, we, we need to think about that. The other thing that, that uh, uh, we've been thinking about a lot that, I, that I'm super into is given the fact that the, the three of us agree, right, that post-COVID is not going to go away. It's going to, there's going to be, we're going to have to deal with this in waves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, okay, if that's the case, then museums like mine need to actually structure their programs so that they can have a physical digital option. Mm -hmm. that, that, is what you, that is where you've got to start to prioritize your programming. Yeah, the so hybrid. For instance, for, yeah. So for instance, both of you have been to Tuesday on the Terrace. For those of you who haven't been, it's this sort of signature program at the MCA. Um, beautiful, beautiful, incredible live jazz on our terrace with dining options. Um, as long as this is happening, um, we could consider perhaps having that, absolutely, uh, while um, safety measures provided by the city and CDC guidelines allow it, or maybe you can enjoy it from your own terrace. Mm -hmm. Maybe we send you a box dinner and you live stream our music. You know, I mean, building this kind of option that is on-site and off-site 
not only is smart for COVID, it's smart for equity. Mm -hmm. it, builds, it builds us here and there simultaneously. That's a gift. Yeah. 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 That, that's beautifully said, Madeline. And you addressed one of the questions from the audience. What ways are you thinking about bringing people back to the museum? And this person wanted to know from a bricks and mortar standpoint. But I also think that you bridge that beautifully. We have to think in terms of a hybrid um, yes. that, you know, people will still want their MCA or their museum, but they may mm -hmm. not quite be ready to venture out. And so what ways can you still give them their MCA and that, that same experience? Um, Amanda, let me just quickly, because a question has popped up um, specifically around um, within the, the world of art, that do you believe that there will be a, a new school of expression um, emerging post pandemic with a focus perhaps on justice and equity? No, I don't think it'll be a new new lens. I think it's, you know, time immemorial. We could go through every period in almost every culture um, that art was was playing this role, whether it's propaganda posters or uh, Guernica from Picasso to Faith Ringo, you know, like, you know, go down the list. It's, you could reframe art history specifically from this lens and not have mm -hmm. enough pages in the book, you know, to tell every story. So I think what you're gonna see is hopefully a more keen eye trained at all the artists that have been doing this work forever that never get recognition because it's so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if we have a society right now, let's, and I'm now meaning the last 50 to 100 years, who's trained on an idea that an object belongs to them and thinks about it in the space of their home, or, you know, there's kind of this territoriality around objects and object making, what about the people that make the image of, you know, the, the young refugee who washes up on the shore? Like, you know, all these things that are like, that's the work and we, but you don't, you know, how, how are you going to locate yourself in that work? Because then that means you have to admit, you know, accountability oftentimes. So I think that the artists that have been doing this work, again, I'm thinking about, especially for some reason today, you know, all the artists that deal with incarcerated populations, the you know Nicole Fleetwood's work and other other folks that are either curators or art makers themselves or um, aging I can't the artist not coming to me but an artist colleague of mine who done a series about dying or you know like and not that that's specifically what this is about but the, the complexity of going beyond just the idea of police brutality which is itself you know is a long kind of um, list of works that could could be referenced and that are going to be created in this moment. I do think there's all this offshoots of work that have to do with the emotions associated with it and the difficulty of, as an artist, feeling a calling to work on something that's not popular or that's not in mm -hmm. the moment. And all of a sudden, now the moment has met you. And so how to stay true to that work and either liberate yourself from feeling like you have the burden of messaging or taking on the responsibility of not making work that doesn't relate to anything in the world. So that, you know, so I think all artists are gonna to have to come to some reckonings, even artists that have been making work about these, these very subjects. When do you get to liberate yourself? If you've been calling and sounding the horn, is this your chance to paint flowers or to, <laughs> or to do whatever? And everybody's gotta decide for themselves. Um, but I just, I just think there's not gonna be some moment or we're not gonna see, if there was something stylistically, I think it's gonna to have to do with the proliferation of the digital which we already were witnessing. So it'd be interesting to analyze it, you know, let's say 20 years from now between either the work of the instant, the video, what, is, what does DIY mean in this moment? Uh, yeah. You know, or, or kind of ready-made or these, these things about urgency and impatience and lack of endurance and lack of resiliency, both either in your attention to the work or the, or the longevity of the work itself. I'm, I told my husband today, I was like, I wanna get every single one of these posters you know, there's a young lady in Montana. I didn't even know there were black people in Montana and she's got to <laughs> check yourself before you wreck yourself. Like, how does she know that? Give me that poster on cardboard, you know, with tempera paint. Like what, you know, so the full spectrum of objects that are being made as a reaction to the thing, you know, are no different than the 60s, than Vietnam, than 
women's movement then right you know 20 cultures i can't even name because i'm not up on my art history you know so over and over this kind of the globalness and the hyper locality despite the globalness but that'll just be a moment of like a longer thing do you know what i mean so it'd be yeah. interesting to see in the snapchat era and TikTok and all these things like how do we archive these things and, yeah. and is the museum's role going to be in that in that regard even on a digital platform you top out at some point, you know, there's not enough tweets to be captured. You know, it's like, how do you, how do you do that? But I don't think, I think there's enough work that's been made. It'd be mm -hmm. interesting to take a look at the people who've been making that work and not being recognized to mm -hmm. see, to see what happens, you know, mm -hmm. in these moments. That, that's actually a question that has popped up from the audience um, to Madeline. How do we archive this moment? Um, what's the role of curators in this moment? Um, first, well, let me just pause and thank Amanda for that extraordinary comment and, yeah. for, and for reminding all of us to give artists uh, their full permission to express themselves as they wish and, uh, and not, uh, you know, forcibly have to comment directly, indirectly, or in any which way. Um, they are, they are uh, uh, you know, they are uh, our, our voices and our souls and uh, we need to uh, follow them um, rather than demand of them. So thank you, Amanda. Um, the and in, in, here's what here's what we're doing. Um, you know, we have we are. Um, I, I love the size of the MCA because we are large enough to have some uh, visibility and some say, but we're also small enough to be very nimble and able to be responsive on some on some fronts. Um, so when, um, uh, when March 13th happened uh, and we closed down and we started to see that the economic shutdown has hit artists particularly hard, uh, you know, galleries are closed that would be selling their work, uh, museums are laying off the kinds of freelance jobs that they depend on uh, because their, their jobs have literally gone away uh, and the nation's unemployment rate is rising to Great Depression era levels. Yesterday we entered officially a recession. Um, so um, we decided uh, to um, cancel uh, an exhibition that was on our books, um, that was coming from Europe, that was already having difficulties in terms of transportation and so on. Um, and um, But not for that reason. We decided to proactively respond to the situation uh, by um, canceling an exhibition and instead uh, we are working, this is, uh, mind you, these, as Amanda knows, these fourth floor exhibitions take two to three years to organize, okay? So I'm telling you that we are now organizing this exhibition in four and a half months, not mm -hmm. three years. And we have decided to have an exhibition in the fall called The Long Dream. Uh, named after Richard Wright's book, that is um, basically, uh, it's going to be um, a made up of commissions and um, artworks by artists from Chicago. This is That's our fantastic. way, this is our way of directly putting um, money and creative fuel and opportunity into our artistic community. This is a direct way that we feel we can do our job to, um, uh, to uh, be part of the, the artistic community at this moment and to provide them with a platform for, um, for this. So that is what we are going to do. That's brilliant. You're getting a lot of hand claps via the chat right now. So thank you for that. I don't have to do the chat talk. It's too I know. I know. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the time. We've got about five more minutes. And um, what I'd like to ask both of you, and this question has popped up from the audience as well, um, you two are so passionate and so giving and so wise. And I don't, I'm not using that term lightly at all. I would love for you in our last five minutes to leave our audience with, because I think it's particularly important 
some optimism and some wisdom. Can you share for the audience um, in the context of however, whatever you want, either something you've learned through this about yourself or your work, um, but let's leave on a note of optimism and wisdom. And Amanda, may I turn to you to start? Sure. Um, I, I would say the, the wisdom might be to just take a deep breath, just take a deep breath. The work is long and we got to pace ourselves. So for me, the wisdom is, is to not be caught up in the, um, the intensity of the moment, right? You got to pace yourself because we got long work to do. And then the optimism is always tricky for me because um, I, never, I never thought even this moment was possible, despite the, the optimism in the work or the call for this kind of moment in the work. And so I would say, um, it might feel like we're walking into the dark, but don't be afraid to walk into the unknown, especially as a, as a, as a room full of designers. Nobody wants to see what you already can see in your head. We want to see what you can't see yet. That's what we all need. And so we are the body of people that provide that for everybody else. So whatever you think is not possible, I mean, from defunding police in Minneapolis, like I'd never in my, I don't even know what that means. I cannot imagine. Mm -hmm. And this is serious, right? This is real. And so I don't know what it means to see, to make for what you can't see, uh, despite having been doing it my whole life, just assuming that if I make it, it will come. And now it's here. I think we all charged with that, but especially the design community is charged with not being afraid to walk into that, that thing you can't see. We are the ones that have to do it. So, you know, let's get to it. That's perfect. That's perfect. Madeline. Oh, I want to second Amanda by saying that um, artists always show us the way out of a dilemma and pivot us to the future. So they will be the first to articulate how we live in this world, this new world, uh, this historic moment. And the other thing I would say is that what we have learned from this crisis, and I'm talking about COVID, is that only by working together can we overcome what seems insurmountable. But I also believe that about this moment of equity and justice. And um, we are living right now in a, in a moment of potential reset and redesign. And museums and designers have a critical, and artists have a critical and very unique role to play in, in helping to build this new society with an increased sense of access and social responsibility and, and, and justice um, and equity. And I believe that museums and artists, designers have never been more important. So yes, I, I second Amanda, let's get to work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much to you both. You are extraordinary women with such an incredible point of view and let's not be afraid of the unseen because the unseen is what shows us the possibilities. So Madeline, Amanda, you guys are, you're the verbs. You're making <laughs> things happen and thank you. And to the audience this afternoon, um, be strong, be brave, be well, take care. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank, thank you. you. That's fantastic, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It was amazing.